Hello, Finimizers. Welcome to another Finimize live event. My name is Stefan. I'm an export flow manager and now an analyst at Finimize. And I'm very happy to host today's event on how to invest like a modern Warren Buffett with our partner, Prospero.ai. So before we dive into what should be a very exciting and, and interesting talk, just some very basic housekeeping rules. Um, number one, as you're coming in, please fill out the poll so we can get to know you a little bit better. Feel free to introduce yourself uh, in the chat. Tell us where you're tuning in from. And remember to switch to all attendees so everyone can see your messages. It's going to be a 15-minute discussion followed by a 15-minute audience Q&A. So please use the Q&A box to ask a question, not the chat box, the Q&A box. And if you see a question you like, upvote it so it moves to the top. And that way, we can get through the most upvoted questions first. All right, so let's kick this off. Our event partner today is Prospero.ai, a transformative fintech startup founded with a mission to democratize access to financial markets. It was founded by a, formal, a former Wall Street hedge fund manager who envisioned a fair and transparent market no longer skewed in favor of large financial institutions. Their groundbreaking platform leverages the power of artificial intelligence to distill millions of real-time data points on stock performance into simple, actionable insights, empowering both novice and seasoned investors. Lots of exciting stuff at, uh, at Prospero, I have to say. I, I actually uh, follow what, everything that you guys write. I'm, I'm, I'm all subscribed. Anyway, today I'm excited to have their CEO, George uh, Kailas, with us. George has always had a very strong aptitude for investing. He bought his first equities at 13 and worked at his first value investing hedge fund at 17. This knowledge base combined with a strong passion for tech as an equalizer has seen him consistently ahead of the curve, not just by starting his first AI company at 25, but now forcing a retail investment community that is informed and he expects a lot more. So he employs a depth of both empathy and financial experience to lead in the creation of unrivaled tools for retail investors, both in accuracy and simplicity. George, impressing, uh, impressive CV, impressing, uh, impressive stuff that you guys are doing. Great to have you here. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Uh, I'm, I'm always happy to see you and, and do things with Finimize. And this is one of my favorite topics, so it's going to be fun. Awesome. So let's start maybe with some context. You know, what's value investing according to Warren Buffett? So Buffett's, you know, simple yet complex definition of value investing is you're looking for undervalued companies with great growth potential. Now, not everyone's necessarily as proficient as Warren Buffett at identifying value or assessing growth potential. So that's some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Awesome. So generally, just like, you know, taking a step back, should investors opt for a value strategy instead of just buying and holding the S&P 500? Why would that be potentially interesting? I talk to a lot of retail investors and, you know, I do private tutoring that, you know, just kind of helps them get better and, and find the right instruments. And that's not always Prospero. And I would say the two most important things I always ask are, do you have more than roughly a half an hour a week to invest in your education? And do you want to get better at investing? And if those two are yeses, you're going to be able to take care of yourself and your family long-term much better if you learn some form of stock picking, whether it be value investing or another methodology, it's important that you learn what's interesting to you. But if you're willing to put that time in, it's definitely better than pass passive investing long-term to invest in your own education. So, you know, I think when we look at the performance of value investing strategies over the last few years, they've been going through a, a hard time. So, you know, what's your view on that? And do you think the trend re will reverse at some point? Well, it's funny, you know, I, I don't think the trend will, will reverse. I, I've been in, you know, as you alluded to value investing for a long time, but even before I worked at my first value fund when I was 17, and I actually taught myself accounting to get that job, I worked at the Center for Value Investing at Columbia, the Ben Graham Center, uh, and I worked for a pretty famous professor, Bruce Greenwald, and, and I learned value investing from some of the best. And it's a great practice, I think, to have among other practices. But a big reason I even went into AI, later started Prospero, looking at you know some of the signals that we looked at, is I felt value investing fell short in too many areas. And just some specific ones that everyone will know. You know I'm sure everyone's heard for years that NVIDIA is overvalued, right? When we look at that, we 
two of our key signals, net option sentiment and net social sentiment, it's been at 100 net option sentiment for a lot of this year as it's continued to go up. And it's been high on net social sentiment. And we would say that those have value in today's market, especially net option sentiment is looking where institutions are betting in the options markets in real time. Social sentiment, I think, you know, most people watching know, but it's a big reason we're beating the market by about 50% each of the last three years, because we do see value in that. It can be hard to quantify, but we've invested a lot of time in getting good metrics with those. And there's value there. And there's value that classic value investing strategies don't acknowledge. And I think that's a big reason that they're lagging because there's a lot of money to be made in you know what we would call new value. So actually, let's talk about 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 that. You know, how has value investing really evolved since uh, Ben Graham's time, and what should you know value investing 2.0 look like today in your view? Well, it's it's really funny because value investing and AI, I think, have had similar growth trajectories. I would say value investing changed a little faster. Um, but you know, for a long time, and for those that don't know, AI has been around. You know, since since the fifties, you know, there's been there's been various AI winters. So for those who haven't followed it as much as me, that's an interesting part. But you know, value investing was similar for even longer when Ben Graham, you know, first you know pioneered it in 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 the twenties. I think was when he started, or maybe that's just when his first book was published. Um, basically, you're looking at these deep value models, and deep value models, you know, when I learned twenty years ago, was very similar to what they were originally, at least in theory, which is you take uh, a company's uh, public filings, you take their public statements, you know, conference calls being the most popular one, and then you build your own model that incorporates, you know, key drivers to the business that you see and how the company talks and how they file, um, as well as, you know, sector-based assumptions. And then you could roll them up into say like a deep discounted cash flow model. If you're looking at free cash flow specifically, which is, you know, more popular for value investors versus like P price to earnings or EPS, which is, you know, a lot more kind of the traditional uh, thing. But, you know, anyway, what it is now is a lot more, you know, I would say there's two primary changes. One, people don't have as much time as they did back in Ben Graham's time. I mean, they barely had electricity then, you know, they could barely move around. You know, they just, you know, invented the first cars uh, and they weren't very good. So we have a lot less, you know, we have a lot less time than, than that had. But the nice thing is as this technology has progressed and it's progressing faster and faster with AI, you know, it can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And, you know, I'd say a few of the most important ways that we like to make things faster for retail investors is you could look at a profitability rating or a growth rating zero to 100 in our in our platform. So instead of having to go through EPS, PE, all that yourself, look at free cash flow, we're actually looking at analyst forecasts, layering in our own economic forecasts on top of those. And then you could just see where a company stacks up in profitability plus growth, zero to 100. And that's something that every investor can understand. They could do quickly. You don't have to look at 2,000 companies or even 10 companies and say, okay, where do they stack up on this scale? You know, we make it easier to see that. And, you know, beyond that, we look to make things even easier than that. Like two of our most powerful ratings are called upside and downside. And basically within those, you can ha basically have, you know, we did a back test of, of five years where we looked at, you know, our metrics above 80. So that was about 10 to 50 stocks on a, on a given day and holding the S&P 500 for a year. And 80% of the days that we tested we, our portfolio actually beat the 500, even though we had less stocks. So you're looking at, you know, in our, you know, high tech solution, something that's more, you know, consistent and can offer like really good returns because the intellectual way to understand it is we're looking at, you know, real time options bets. We're looking at analyst ratings and, and how they're being adjusted as well as price momentum factors. So to have above an 80 upside breakout, the options markets have to like something long-term in real time, analysts have to love it and price momentum factors all have to agree. So you can understand intellectually how that would work. And, you know, that's one of the main things that we're trying to do for people, you know, instead of you having to pour through, you know, all of those, uh, all of those statements and conference calls, you know, a lot of what we're doing is not only summarizing that and say a profitability and growth, we're also leaning on institutions that spend billions of on data, 
billions on technology to say, hey, what are they doing? Let's amalgamate it very quickly and show you in real time what it's doing so you can get what their assessment combined of value is. And that was a very intentional process that we wanted to do because we often see retail investors falling behind uh, institutions. And this was a way to help them keep up. Yeah, you know, I think there's this massive misconception in, in markets that you've got value on one side and growth on the other side. And I think what you're saying is that, look, value does not have to be anti-growth, right? Growth can be actually uh, quite a good expression of value, a, a, good, a good characteristic of value. So in your view, how do you define that Prospero value? I think you mentioned a few indicators, but maybe you can just, uh, you know, explain it a little bit. Uh, uh, in more details, how you guys define value, and then maybe you know if you can highlight any specific value plays uh, right now. Yeah, so we have ten signals, and we like to say that those ten signals are our assessment of value. You know, I named some of them. You know, upside, downside, net option sentiment, profitability, growth. I was I'm actually going to go through some you know general rules at the end of how people can you know stay out of you know stay out of trouble by following those. Um, but, you know, in terms of how we provide value, you want to look at all those signals, right? Because, for example, you could have upside that's way higher than downside. You can even have good net options and net social sentiment. But we have two metrics, short pressure and dark pool. I've seen stocks that have very high in those me measures, but like a high dark pool rating, which basically indicates that institutions are doing things outside of the market to move the price. And then short pressure, which means it's heavily shorted. So, you know, we're trying to paint a full picture of what we think value is with 10 metrics. So I think that that's important because, you know, a big problem with value investing as we're talking about is that, you know, sometimes if you lean too much on singular metrics or, you know, say just how much a company is earning, you can miss a lot of what's going on in the market that could indicate there's differentiators of value. And, you know, one of my favorite, you know, value lessons that I learned later in life um, that also is our medic, uh, that it is also would be our, our recommendation is meta. And I'll tell you, when I worked at my first hedge fund, my boss sat me down on my first day and he told me a story. And he said, uh, you know, George, my best investment ever was a garbage company. And nobody liked it. I looked at it and I said, you know, there's great value there based on how much they're earning. And he just looked at me, he said, always look for the garbage and find the garbage. And, and this story about Meta is going to be about how I applied that lesson a little later. So we've had Meta at 100 upside uh, since 2-16-23. So it was, it was at about $170 when it first got on the radar because it was at our max upside rating. And you know what I did? I said, you know what? Our algorithms don't know that Zuckerberg's an idiot and he's messed up and like they, they, they've got this wrong. So... It turns out I was the idiot, at least for a little bit, because two months later, I'm seeing Meta start to go up. It's a little above 200 now. I see it still at 100 upside. And I said, and I, I thought more, and I said, wait, if these institutions are betting on it, it's not just a fluke. And I looked more, and I was like, actually, they're doing really smart things in open source with with PyTorch. They are pretty consistently the third best growth company in the MAG7, and they are highly profitable and they're expanding globally. So I was like, maybe I'm, maybe I, I really like overlooked him. And it's funny because like I was early to that and more and more people are seeing Meta as a great company. And, you know, even going into earnings, we added a hundred upside and a hundred net option sentiment. So even though people were worried, Google posted bad earnings, uh, especially with YouTube revenue, people were worried. We had it there and our signals like cut through that noise. And it's just what we said, you know, in order to stay at that 100 upside breakout for all the time that it did, analysts had to keep raising their price targets. The options bets had to stay live. They had to, they had to renew them or keep betting in the long-term options markets. And price momentum factors had to be there. You know, they couldn't start declining even if those other two things were true. So, you know, that's why we still, that's why we still love it. You know, people keep thinking that there's more value there. And, you know, they continue to do smart things in open source with Llama 3. We do think their investment in the metaverse was early, but we do think longer term um, that will pay off and people like it. They're doing smart things with AI monetization as well. So yeah, that, that I love because not only did the signals help us get there early, you know, a lot of what some people love about our signals that can be challenging with technicals is I've seen meta 
overbought on RSI numerous times as we've been holding it and our signals continue to stay there. And that's the nice thing, you know, it's not dependent on, you know, traditional price patterns that, you know, will always break if companies do keep, you know, beating their estimates and doing, you know, what also a company like NVIDIA did. So I think that's a very important part of what we do, especially in looking at, you know, where institutions are betting in real time that can give you a comfort that if you see our numbers, you know, they're live, you know, they're good, you know, they're not managed around some past line, like a lot of technical analysis, they're incorporating the very rigorous, you know, technology research data that these hedge funds are using to make their bets in real time. Awesome. Thank you so much, George. So nice time to move on to the questions. So please don't forget to ask your questions in the Q&A box, but also to uh, upvote the questions you're interested in, uh, in hearing the answer first. So let's start with the first question. To learn and become successful in value investing, what daily, weekly, monthly time commitment do you believe is required? Like I said, I think anything more than and then a half hour is is good and it just consistency is so important you know you have to you have to basically find your own way and one of the things that i always say is like a little bit of a hack for people to find their own way is you know if you're a doctor biotech stocks might be good for you if you work in retail retail stocks might be good for you learn and leverage what you know already build your own research process, do it consistently, you know, mark your reasons for trading, your investment thesis or your reason for investing, and you will get better over time. But you can't be too haphazard about it. You have to be consistent. You have to leverage what you know. And the most important question, like to ask yourself, don't look at prices, you know, like value investors say that's just like Mr. Market. There's a difference between, you know, the price and the value. So just because you've made money doesn't make you right. You're right if you have a thesis and it proved correct, you're not right because the price goes up. And if you're honest with yourself and say, have I built a process that is making me right about the reasons for a stock going up over and over again, not just the price going up. How does Prospero's platform in particular integrate AI with the traditional value investing elements to spot high potential stocks? So, I think one of the things that's very important to us, and you know, going back to my last company, we had joint invention patents with NYU for things that advance is evolving neural networks. But Prospero actually more follows a Bridgewater model of integrating AI. So we have very solid linear formulas, some of them value-based um, that underlie, you know, some of the things specifically on the profitability and growth ratings I mentioned, those aren't made with AI. Those are made with solid linear relationships um, that, we then use AI to do things like gather, filter data, weigh information based on market conditions that help us figure out, you know, basically how much of a given formula, relationship, algorithm we want to use on any given day. So we leverage it for speed and flexibility. But the core that we use is very much built on value relationships that I've learned, program tested over, you know, you know, 20 years just on the pure value side, 13 years on the value mixed with AI side. Or there, uh, oh, the question just moved. Sorry, one second. Or there any interesting stocks you have your eyes on right now? If so, why? So there's a lot of stocks at any given time that I have my eyes on. You know, one of the ones that I think is highly interesting is Eli Lilly. And that is interesting because, and I'm flagging it because that's not a traditional value bet. If you look at the PE ratio of Eli Lilly, um, you're not looking at a stock with great value. Uh, but, you know, biotech especially um, traditionally runs at higher PEs and they've proven to be great innovators you know, their market cap, if you look at it, just like up, 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 they continue to come out with new products. You know, institutions, I, I've never seen them really, you know, go too low in terms of how they're betting on them in the short 
or the long-term options markets. So there's a lot of confidence in the management team as a result of that. You don't see that kind of behavior. So that's one. Another one kind of on, you know, the volatility more, you know, more dangerous up and down side is SMCI. We we see it recovering a little bit the last few days, but it got down to a 24 PE ratio. And you compare that to like a much higher PE ratio of NVIDIA. And obviously, you know, NVIDIA, you're getting a lot more safety in that growth. But SMCI kind of, you know, it, it got a lot of momentum behind it, then lost it. But now it's, you know, looking like a, a better value play. Uh, but, you know, those are kind of, you know, at two different ends of the spectrum. Uh, but yeah, I could go on all day about stocks, but I should I should take more questions. So what are the biggest mistakes retail investors make when trying to value invest? That's a great question. So I think the first thing that the first big mistake retail investors make when trying to value invest is that they're not value investing. I see very few retail investors actually value investing. And the core of it is you could use some of the modern value things like, you know, like we're talking about, but there's there's so many people that don't do simple checks like what is the like what is the pe ratio of this company relative to others in, in the sector and i suggest you could use yahoo finance you can use barons look at what the competitors are there and just do a check and say like are these actually value or is the way i'm looking at value you know some other thing you know the other thing that i saw when I actually was, I, I I was in AMC and I got out of it, there were so many people that said, oh, like how can Cinemark be trading at a higher price than, um, than AMC? But what they weren't realizing is that it was actually trading at, uh, you know, AMC was actually trading at a higher market cap. So they weren't multiplying the price by shares. And then, you know, especially if companies are losing money, you have to look at things like revenue multiples, like revenue to enterprise value. And like, that's something that, you know, I would say uh, when I was talking to people like that invested in say SoundHound, right? What I was looking at was I was saying like, look, if you look at the enterprise value, you know, relative to revenue, or you look at some of these other things, you know, why would you own like, yeah, SoundHound AI could grow, but basically like you're paying more for it than NVIDIA. Why would, you know, why would you do that when NVIDIA is, you know, going really, you know, growing really fast as well as being profitable. So I would say those are two like really bite-sized tips. Make sure you're looking at, you know, comps, whether they be PE for others in the sector and just making sure, you know, you're rationalizing that because sometimes people aren't. And then if companies aren't making money, don't just toss revenue out the window because you can't do a proper PE analysis. You should look at things like revenue relative to enterprise value. What books would you recommend reading on value investing? So one is going to be, you know, you can never substitute like the intelligent investor like that is you know that's kind of like the core value one i'll give you a more non-traditional one which is fooled by randomness um to nicholas nasim taleb's book that's a great thing you know when i talk about like being honest with yourself it's a really great thing to be able to say like oh uh am i do i really have a pattern or do I not? Because he talks about how professional traders all the time are fooled by randomness. So that's one of the best things you can do in your education. And then reading Warren Buffett's, they're not as good now, but going back, it's not a book, reading his letters to the shareholder, um, especially the older ones, that's basically like a blueprint of how to value invest. Now, a very practical question, how to understand the right time to sell stocks? So... I honestly, sorry if this is a, a, a cop out for people, like I struggled with this and why a reason like before I had Prospero signals, I was a passive investor because I think even technicals can get it wrong. Like we have a great, um, we have a great metric called net option sentiment. And it's a very easy way to look at, you know, net net if, if institutions are bullish or bearish in the short term options markets. And if you go in our app, if you see it above 50, that's good. That's that's bullish enough that you don't have to sell. If you see it going below 50, it's time to sell. I do it every time. Um, and then, you know, some other quick hacks. I would say we also have upside and downside in the long-term options markets. Same kind of thing. If upside isn't higher than downside, then I sell. Um, so I think 
selling is the toughest thing. And one of the reasons we invented the metrics that we did is I don't actually see any good way other than using the metrics that we have to determine that. How does value investing compare or tie into a core satellite approach? Should we allocate a certain percentage to this and a proportion then to a more passive approach? Great question. It really did like it really depends on like your risk tolerance, your available funds. Like actually the the core if you're worried about anything with your funds. Uh I almost always like, you know, you don't, you don't lose them. I almost always advocate for about 50% in a dividend stock like Schwab dividend, SCHD. Um, and then I would say the other 50%, you know, I, I, I would say maybe 30, 40% of it is good to, good to put in value, you know, or another ETF, depending on how much time you have, but value stocks that you really like that are stable that that have growth potentials but are also you know profitable already and then 20 you know whether it be you know the other 10 20% that you can start experimenting with you know higher risk things you know if you want to be really safe you put 50 value 50 in you know something dividend um and then uh and then just with the dividends that's what you start instead of reinvesting them you start putting them into riskier uh things but you know, just a very, you know, whether or not um, you're using, you know, Prospero and using something like we always tell people, if you're using our metrics, look for profitability plus growth above 120, because you're basically looking above average. But if you're not looking at that, what I would just look for is e like positive EPS and EPS growth. That's a very important way. You know, obviously we said relative to sector, everything like that. But if you're saying like, hey, what is value? Like in a way where you're just like looking what to put in your portfolio in addition to, you know, kind of like your safer base. Um, I would say positive EPS, EPS growth um, and consistent, maybe even beating estimates. That's always helpful too. Um, that's a good way to just make sure you're staying on the safer side and you're getting real value. What's the best way to implement the Prospero's buy and sell signals, which in particular are the ones that may indicate a powerful buy or sell signal? So, you know, the newsletter that I think is shared, we we basically every week and then for the paid version in real time, tell you what we think the best way to use the signals to create a portfolio are. And there's a free version of it too that you can sign up for if you don't want to do the paid version, where once a week we tell you exactly what we're thinking there. Otherwise, I'll just kind of I'll just kind of review the the rules that I've kind of blasted out. Um, you want upside to be higher than downside. You want net option sentiment to be greater than fifty, and you want profitability plus growth to be greater than one hundred and twenty. And I would avoid stocks that have short pressure plus dark pool above one hundred and twenty. Those are the best ways to just risk manage. But other than that, we you know. That's kind of how looking at like a portfolio level, how you might want to like balance everything and just look at risk on a portfolio level. We have, you know, a section that says our picks. We have, you know, short-term bear, long-term bear, short-term bull, long-term bull, you know, all there right at the beginning of the app. And then we publish a screener every day that has, you know, our market view or my market view. I'm the one that does it. Um, so yeah, a lot of different ways to, to kind of like use rules on your own, look at our recs, or then if you want to see how we're using those recs to build portfolios, you know, that's where the newsletter comes in. Um, and just like to put a bow on it a little bit, like if you look at our picks, short and long-term bulls, you're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, consumer cyclical, a lot of tech, a lot of healthcare, because that's where like the most speculation is on the institutional and retail level. So if you want to look at a portfolio, you can't just like buy all of the R picks. You have to use some of what the some portfolio management strategy, and that's what we teach in the letter. George, thank you so much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, but uh, guys, don't worry. George will be back with us next month for another Finimize Live event where he will share five portfolio hacks for busy investors. Uh, you can actually use the link in the chat to secure your spot right now. 
Uh, and please don't forget, you can also uh, join us for the Finimize Modern Investor Summit on December uh, 3rd and 4th. This two-day event will be packed with back-to-back -back sessions and workshops led by the biggest names in finance. So, you know, don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. Uh, you know, you'll have the opportunity to, to learn, but also to network with other retail investors. And you can pre-register for your ticket using the other link, link um, shared in the chat. Uh, as you leave the event today, a pop-up survey will appear on your screen. Please take a few minutes to let us know what topics you're interested in hearing about so that we can plan uh, future events. George, thank you so much. This was incredibly uh, valuable. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Take care. Thanks for having me.